Hello there and welcome to another insightful and enlightening episode of African Student Voice on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. And my name is Ajaman Ocho Dako. And today, you know, we're looking at students, their money and savings. We've come to understand that, you know, earning money and saving money are two things that students have an issue with. Some students will go to school for four years and can't earn money. Some can't save money and we come out of school and are now relying on parents. Quite frustrating uh, situation that is. But today I have some professors in the house who are going to speak to the issue on how we can inculcate the habit of saving and how you can save no matter how much you have and how you can also create a money earning system for yourself on campus so you can take care of yourself and be independent in terms of finances so the parents can also find other things to do with their money and you can be independent with your money during this COVID-19 period you can also take care of yourself and have a nice time on campus so don't go anywhere we'll come up for this pause I'll let you know who they are and what they have for you Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet. With our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming machines and others, you are sure to get the best of production. Visit us at Trinity Avenue in East Legon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board or contact the AAU Studio via the following addresses. Info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, Ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on 0244-185-998 or 0244-6 Nine three three four two. You're welcome back to African Student Voice on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. And my name is Ajaman Ochodako. I told you that I have some professors in the house who are well endowed. Yes, they have the uh, understanding. They've been doing a lot of advocacies and trainings on financial management and literacy. So today I'll let you know who they are. And with me in the studio today, yeah, the first lady is she's Miss Sedinam Ameku, and she's the CEO, founder of finance, uh, female and finance organization. I'm, I know you're wondering, what, what what is that? But you know what it is. And I have with me Pete, Mr. Peter Kwejo uh, Asaronyako, and he's also the CEO, executive director for the Center for Financial Literacy uh, and Education in Africa. Nice to put your welcome to African Student Voices. Thank you. I'm Thank so you. glad to have you here because uh, students in Africa actually have given me uh, a responsibility to bring onto this show what they need, what they want to hear. And one of the most important things they need now is how they can manage their funds. Because we'll be going back to school very soon. And when we go back to school, how can we survive in times like this? We know COVID-19 has slowed business down. So we won't be expecting the same cash flow we used to expect those times yeah. and we'll have issues a bit tight but how could we manage this so i found you sure. to be here and they are glad to have you here sure. we are glad to be here nice <laughs> nice nice so uh, we'll start with uh Sadie. yeah Sadie, tell us about uh, female and finance organization quite, quite a unique name for an organization how did it start with you okay um Growing up, mm -hmm. I have always wished to help people um, acquire wealth. Great. Even though I didn't have <laughs> any. <laughs> um, but I was looking at um, advising high income earners. Okay. But something changed. After my national service, um, I once decided to walk around in the area. And on the first day, I saw some women guarded. Mm -hmm. The second day, I saw them guarded. Mm -hmm. And then I was wondering, <laughs> what is the reason? Why would these people, uh, these women, gather here almost every day yeah. instead of going to work? Sure. So I asked my mom later, and then she told me, oh, those women are gathered there because they take loans and they gather to pay and all of that. Mm -hmm. And they are in groups. And then she just added that, oh, they don't even use the loans wisely. Okay. So that part 
of her statement caught my attention mm -hmm. and I joined these women um, in their next meeting. To take notes? Or? I, just, I just wanted to know exactly what was going on there because mm. you have to be part of them to know what. So I sat at the far end. Okay. I knew they were wondering that why would this lady come and sit here because they hardly see me in the area and nobody know my mommy. Mm. So I understood that these women <laughs> were actually taking these loans not for reasons that they should. Everything changed at that moment. I went home. It was on my mind that I needed to do something. And then <laughs> I decided to form Females and Finance Organization um, by having my first program in my community Whoa. where I had to go house to house Whoa. to talk to them, Whoa. to invite them Whoa. to the program. You, you should be nodding by now. I mean, <laughs> this is cause for a lot of nodding. Like, this is an idea. Powerful. Peter, What's <laughs> how did it start with you? All right. Uh, I grew up in a farming community. Okay. And so I learned to be a producer mm -hmm. rather than a consumer. Okay. So I, w I always wanted to do something for myself. Mm -hmm. So growing things had a huge impact on his life okay. in his old age. Okay. He was successful with money, well accomplished. But because of his financial actions, mm -hmm. he was struggling financially. He mm -hmm. couldn't build that financial legacy. Yeah. So this story really informed me, this story motivated me to take that message to the people. Mm. And also looking around, uh, I saw a lot of old folks who were struggling with their finances after retirement, a lot of family who go through a lot of stress because they were not financially uh, sound. Sure. They couldn't take the right financial decisions yeah. in their working age. And looking at our educational system, financial literacy isn't taught in school. Sure. We can graduate with a four-year degree and... Well, we don't nothing, even have to manage our money. We don't know about <laughs> finances. So I decided to be that change. Because there's this saying that be the change you want to see in the world. So exactly. I decided to stand for financial literacy. Exactly. Put the message out there so that people can manage their money world well and plan for their future. Great. So I started with my ambassador's network. Mm -hmm. This was a money matters. So from there, 2019, we started a center for financial literacy, mm -hmm. Education Africa, mm -hmm. with two other colleagues. We wanted to uh, make up the, this whole advocacy, wanted to make it official so that we can reach out to a lot of people. Yeah. No, allow me to make this clear to my, 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 my friends, family watching uh, all over the country that if you listen to this story right here, you are informed that. And it's not always the degree that you get that informs your certificate or your CV to go get a job out there. There's some part of you that can start a job. That is just, by the way, let's come back to the, to the interview. So for how long have you been doing this, Peter? Okay, I'll say six years. Six years? Yes. I started in 2014. Mm -hmm. So I formed Vim Ambassadors Network in 2014. Okay where we go to schools to talk to people about their finances. Mm. So, and I started getting the recognition I was speaking on. Youth programs, church programs, inspiring people, entrepreneurial platforms, and yeah, so. Say, how about you? How? A little over, um, let's say two years. Two years. Let's say two years. Um, in September, it'll be two years, so almost. Mm. Sure. Yeah. What was the reaction? from the people you sought to help initially okay how would they like so um the first thought that um um where i started my community and mm -hmm. you don't get to sit at home and just do nothing and so when they see you they even greet you first mm -hmm. all the people community supervisor right <laughs> <laughs> so when they saw that i came to their homes they were surprised and they wanted to hear from me. Mm. So when I told them I'm having a program for them, um, they, they didn't hesitate to uh, attend. Even though they didn't understand what I wanted to do, they thought I was working with the bank and wanted them to open accounts with mm. my bank. Yeah. But I made everything clear to them. And they really, up till now, some of them still come to my home 
and say they have so so, so amount of money what should they use it for oh that's and amazing. it's amazing, amazing that i started in my community and they accepted me and received me i was 65 women showed up that day for the program so my little 500 to 600 students that um i say from my not that i saved but i took from my national service uh, savings the money that's what i used for the organization and all of that so i saw that it didn't go waste the chairs i carried myself did not go waste <laughs> yeah <laughs> the claim i did there didn't go waste i was warmly received and they received a the message well. amazing amazing <laughs> now let's come to the main issue so this is about students right here uh when students here financial issues you know making money is a good thing no but saving money is one of the difficult things that we have sure. let's start it from the basics some students say there's this uh, statement that so you like saving we don't like saving what is your view towards that peter you don't like saving why how okay i i, I will relate it to our upbringing yeah so growing up we see our parents not saving money they themselves they didn't know their sense of saving yeah and it became part of us so in our community people don't really take savings seriously mm -hmm. so we it has become part of us and that's the reason why most people don't like saving so it's it's a culture thing we didn't we were not taught about saving we we're not uh, educated on the essence of saving. Why should I put money down yeah. for some day? So we don't have that perception, that uh, future uh, benefit of putting money down. So we tend to spend all our money. Our parents do impulse buying and all that. So it has become part of us. And mm -hmm. I also think young people think they have a lot of time. Well, I'm young and... I have a lot of time ahead of me, so if I don't see, we don't have that much time. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, Sadi, um, yeah. someone would say, I'm a student. I was sent to the university to go and learn. Yeah. I don't have any job. Mm -hmm. And uh, savings, we know those who work to otherwise will save. Yeah. Because they earn big and they save big. But for us, we are students. So, savings is showing me part of us. Uh, are we wrong when we say that? We, um, they are very well. Mm. Yeah, very well. Okay. So, <laughs> savings does not mean that you're saving a hundredth of the hundred you have. Mm. Savings means, even if it's 0.001%, mm. you are saving something. Okay. And um, usually I'll say that the youth, um, when we are talking about the savings and stuff, we should go beyond the savings and talk about investment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, savings actually ends things just like that, but sure. investment is better. Okay. So I uh, prefer to talk about investment instead. Okay. So if um, I go to school, for example, I'm in school and mommy sends me 100 cities. What is wrong if I put two cities down? Mm -hmm. It doesn't change anything. Okay. It doesn't spoil anything but we forget and we just look at what we need to do and just dump the money there that is that is something that students forget and students don't like to talk about money okay yeah when you organize a program I think Peter can help me here when you organize a program for students to talk about money trust me they will show up. <laughs> okay. yes mm. they want to be entertained sure but entertainment i wish to go to dubai in my 60s mm. oh yeah when i have the money and, and i know that i can relax my mind mm. but that is not what the youth um, is focusing on they want to have it now and now mm. invite a youth and tell the person hey, i want you to come for a program even zoom meeting or maybe a Facebook, oh, forget it. But a live concert, the youth is there. Sure. Mm. We don't like to talk about money. We run away from money topics. Sure. And that is what they are interested in. But um, these, are, these are the places where we can what, learn to save. Mm. 
learn from others about how they've been disciplined about their money. The whole thing is about discipline. Okay. And you're actually moved by when somebody tells you my story, I was able to see so, so, and so, and this is how it is done. You go to your bed, and it rings that mm -hmm. I can also do it. And our educational um, background to count here. Myself and Peter and then um, two other or three other organizations presented a petition to the Ministry of Finance <laughs> early this year to revamp financial literacy education in Ghana. Mm. So um, our education, there is a question mark. Mm. Students have to learn things themselves. Yeah. But sometimes we learn to acquire something we can manage. Yeah. That is the money. Yeah. <laughs> We learn, we go to school, we learn to make money, sure. but we don't learn how to manage the money. And that is, that is a loop in our educational system. And mm. I think if there is a change in that, it can help us as a nation or the youth. Splendid. Sure. So, Peter, the issue about we don't like saving, sure. you know, we don't work. We are not working. Sure. So we can't make money. <laughs> what do you have for that particular student in that condition? <laughs> okay, so I would say... That statement has no basis <laughs> because money comes to our hand every single day, okay. even if you are not working. Okay. Your mom is giving you money, mm -hmm. your dad is giving you money, mm -hmm. and that money you can save a portion of it. Okay. So I think, as I said, now I was saying, temptation. We are not uh, inspired to save money that discipline is not there mm. but once we develop the habit of saving once saving becomes a lifestyle mm. even if we get one city we will start saving money so i have some nieces and nephews in my house and i have inculcated that habit in them mm. so i bought two box for them and i told them once mommy gives you one city put 20 pesos in the box okay when in December, I'll come and open it for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to reach a certain amount, I will add a certain amount to that amount that you have been able to raise. Okay. So once uh, we develop this habit, it becomes part of us. And any amount that comes to us, we're able to put a part down. Mm -hmm. Yes. So no one should say that I'm not earning that huge amount. So mm -hmm. I won't say if I'm not saving now, what, uh, what is the basis that when you get 10,000 Ghana CD, you will save? <laughs> if you're only saving one CD from your 10 CD, okay. what is the basis that you save 1,000 CDs from your 10,000 CD? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's getting, it's getting interesting right here with financial literacy. And you know, um, if you can't save just one CD from your 10 CDs, forget it. <laughs> but you know, we can make it happen. We'll go for a quick pause. We'll come back. We'll talk about more on financial uh, literacy management. Don't go anywhere. This is Africa's most friendly nation, Ghana. A warm reception awaits you in an environment where you can discover and harness your full potential. Your home is an academic haven lying northeast of the city center, a quick dash from the airport. A spirited community where young, vibrant minds are empowered to express themselves, break academic boundaries, and thrive in an atmosphere of rich cultural heritage and excellence in various collegiate and extracurricular activities. This institution represents a whole new world of fun and offers you a variety of activities, facilities and services geared towards your total development. Believing in the uniqueness of all our students, we encourage them to pursue excellence in integrity. Welcome to the University of Ghana, your preferred academic destination. All right, welcome back to African Student Voice. Just joined us and just tuned in. It's African Student Voice on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. And we are committed 
to provide you the platform to learn and be enlightened about everything about students welfare and well-being and today we're talking about financial literacy and management believe me every student in Africa needs this now how to end your money how to make your money how to keep your money for the future and before one for the part to talk about now this uh, statement of we can save is not debunked we now have a reason to save sure. yeah. but we want to be very um, concise here how do we make money for ourselves on campus okay. because this, this is now something that we have to start doing we can't just go to school all through and then we didn't do anything sure. in terms of wealth creation so everybody's asking how do we make the money Sadi, how do we make the money on campus okay before this whole investment system. Yes. So um, I would always refer to me being in school. Mm -hmm. When I was in school, people were selling mm -hmm. businesses. You could see um, people who were into businesses, mm -hmm. which I never did any. Yeah. I was only interested in solving mathematics. How do you feel about that now? I feel very bad mm -hmm. because That's I could have made some few cities from that. Okay. Because students like buying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that students should not be shy of involving themselves in business while in school. So far as it would not take them to a third class or a grade or a, a class that they wouldn't like, mm. they should give attention to it. Okay. They can. They have. We have so much time on campus. Trust me, so much time because your parents has uh, having to complete and then get a good grade so I want to give them all the time that they want I wouldn't call them to come home to come and do so so and so for me so they're in school we have so much time and how many how many times do we go for lectures sometimes a day once the rest of the day what happens trust me we don't learn <laughs> just few of us that go in the evening we learn and all of that we just stay in the hostel talk few you learn that time we could be doing business we could be moving from hostel to hostel selling we could think about something, something that we could do, get the skills that can what give us money in the short term. These are things we fail to do, and we are kind of shy. And my mom brought me to school to come and learn, and that was something I also said to myself that oh, after all, I'm not business minded. My mom brought me to school to come and learn. Why would I be doing business? But these people were making money, yeah. and you could see a change in their lifestyle. Mm. I wish. I did that. Yes. So <laughs> the youth or students in the university get something done. Mm. There is something you can sell. Even if it is key, <laughs> if it is slippers, sell it. These are things people had you buy from the house. Mm. And you can be at the point of sales when they come mm. or point of their need when they come. And they will all come to you. Sure. So Get something doing a business in school, it's not bad. It's no. a good thing. That's just amazing. <laughs> P, what have you got to say to that? A lot. A lot. Yes, so focus on service, just like Zidam said. Students should focus on service. They should provide value for their colleagues. Mm. So become a solution provider. So when people need something, your name should come to mind. Mm -hmm. So mostly on campus, people were calling me could be a businessman <laughs> businessman because i saw anything <laughs> that people need mm. so I, I listen to conversation a lot i'll come and sit down and then i'll be listening to them we need this we need this and i'll provide that thing for the students so let's focus on service let's serve other people because once you start serving once you start providing solutions you are creating value and people will pay you for that so look around you, your friends, your dormitory, what the, your colleagues needs, even your roommate. You can start serving your roommate, mm -hmm. and she will pay you for for for, for that. Yeah. So I would, there's this uh, lady who was doing uh, was writing project work for her colleagues. Yeah. And they pay her for that. So let's become solution providers. Yeah. Let's solve other people's problems on campus. Mm -hmm. And once we start doing that, we start making the money. We just have to monetize it. Yeah. Sure. You know, somebody will say that if it's about money making yeah. uh, and money savings, then anything, anything goes. Uh, some will throw coins under their beds 
and at the end of every month, yeah. some will trade to their wardrobes, into their shoes, into money boxes. Yeah. What do you think is the, the adequate model that we should call inculcate to make sales and investments worthwhile? Okay, so I'll start with the sushi box yeah. and putting money in the wardrobe and all of that. So recently, um, a boy actually, a man, well, I didn't mm, know, okay. actually came um, on social media showing a box of money that he opened after I think a year. Yeah. Sure. And it was so much money. When I looked at it, I said, this is not money. Why would I say that? If this guy or man had saved in the bank, or maybe not saved in the bank, invested the money, if you save, you are getting just a money, something that is more substantial. But if you invest it, you're going to get something at least reasonable. But this guy is getting the same amount of money he put there. Which doesn't make um, using a susu box or putting your money in a wardrobe saying you are saving a good way of investing or saving. The thing is that susu box, I think the use of susu box is that you keep money inside for a short period of time, mm. say a month. Okay. Then after the month, you send it back to you go in and invest it. Okay. But if you want to do it for a year, I think it's 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 a it's a it's a bad habit mm. and people should desist from that. Okay. It's a short term um bank, if I should say, personal bank. Mm. But it shouldn't become a long term thing. The world has evolved. The world of banking has evolved. The world of putting money in the world of under the um layer or the cloth enough of it under the pillow enough of it so soup box is for a short term thing at least a month you should take that money out the soup box how much is it break it take that money out and invest it mm. it becomes a habit so you start getting more yeah so Peter. so peter can mm -hmm. yeah, take yeah, that yeah. You, you know yeah so that that attitude we we go and buy with super and we'll be checking it. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know if you made the impact. <laughs> we make it bye bye. If if you hear your quest, you're not going anywhere. If you sure. don't hear anything, sure. you made something. But what do you think should be the right way? What sh what should be the best uh, approach when it comes to savings? Okay. To save? So I always say the only reason you should be saving money as a young person is yeah. to invest it. Okay. So savings. Yes, you have to save. You have to take your money to the bank, create a savings account, yeah. because the bank is only there to protect your money. Sure. So when you keep your money in the house, and robbers can come for it. <laughs> you can even be your own and robber yeah, and you see yourself. start stealing your money. Start denying the fact that you didn't do yeah, that. So you take your money to the bank for them to protect your money for you, but it should be a stated period of time, mm. say one month, yeah. two months. You don't need to save your money beyond three months. Mm. Your money should be working as hard as you are working. Mm. Yeah. So money must work. So we, we should save our money. We should develop that habit, but we should also invest the money. Mm. We should channel the money so that the money can also be earning additional income for us. Mm. So I would say as a young person, the only reason to be saving money is to invest it. Good. Put your money to work. Good. You know, I, I want us to revisit the issue where you mentioned that you know you have to get a business. You know, sometimes if you ask a number of students, out of the many, yeah. they say, we don't have anyone to give us the funds. Okay. We can't raise the funds. Okay. So we can't do anything. Okay. Should should we be worried about that aspect where you have to get a chunk of money like a thousand dollars to go to the business? Mm -hmm. Without that we can't do anything. Okay. So number one. The way we ask our parents for money, mommy, I want this, I want money, you can ask for that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't put your mind to it, you won't get it. Mm -hmm. You say you ask for a, a John the Baptist head. Yeah. <laughs> this is a huge request. No? Yeah. We can't so, give you that much money. At least ask her, Mama, I want to do some business in school. I need 200 cities. Your mom would think and rethink and be like, my child is asking for money to do business in school. Mm -hmm. And if you have a parent, who is business oriented, trust me, she'll find a way of giving it to you. Mm. We get cash gifts and all of that. Yeah. Those monies could be channeled into that. Okay. And I want the youth to hear something from me today. Find businesses that you can buy shares in. Okay. There are some people who are really promising. Trust me. 
in school, these people are now making money. I was there, uh, we met, and they are making money from that business that they started in school. Okay. I wish I, I put my mind to it and say, oh, I'm putting at least 300 cities in it. I'm buying shares in it. We only think going to the bank to buy shares is what makes it that you have shares in it. No, 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 no. Sure. Look for a friend's business. Look at the business. Ask your friend, how do you intend making the money? So if you can't earn, if you can't, if you can't run a business, this is an option. Look for a business that you think can make it even after the four years or even after you are done with school sure. and invest in it keep documents you may it's a risk but you are hopeful and you may get returns from that mm -hmm. so you put your money to work at an early stage not necessarily putting your money into another business we are not all called to do business mm -hmm. that is one thing people have to know okay. people are supposed to go to the corporate world if we are all doing business and who, who is going to be in the bank mm -hmm. no one so some people are called to do business some are not but if you are not called to do business, look at the option. Mm. <laughs> So, P, no, so sure. this issue of money making that's creating value for yourself, I don't have the money. I don't have the money. Who can help me I'll get money to do business? Yes. Uh, beyond our periods, what other avenues can we uh, actually explore sure. to raise these funds? Okay, so I'll say it revolves around your network. Look around your network. Okay. Uh, you have a nice idea, mm -hmm. but you don't have the money for it. Okay. There is a big man out there who is looking for ventures to invest his or her money in. Okay. So you just have to look around your network. So first, you have to build a network because there's a saying that your network determines your network. Yeah. So the people around you, you can see them with your idea, convince them on how the reason why they need to put their money in, in your, your business. business. And these people, trust me, they want to get additional money on their money. Sure. So once you give them the statistics, once you give, trust me, they will be willing to put their money into it. Mm -hmm. So look around your network, talk to people that you know can support you, people that you can uh, trust your ideas with. I, 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 I wanted to start a business. I was having this nice idea and I went to almost 15 people. 14 rejected the idea, but one person decided to invest in it. Okay. So initially, people will reject your idea. People, others will want to own the idea. But once you keep to it and you talk to different, a lot of people, you will get someone who will invest in your idea mm. and you will start your business. Amazing. Amazing. You know, I, I met a couple of students when I asked them, so uh, how do you make money? So for us, we, we do sports better. Uh, <laughs> that's where we get our money and it, it, I think the sport betting companies so do okay, students we'll get close to them so we, everywhere they go we'll get close to them so every university in Ghana you look around there's sports betting somewhere so they make quick money there they don't yeah. get dry yeah so they make sport bet and he said okay there it came to help us I mean we are now um, keeping ourselves okay we don't call our parents anymore sure. because we are okay yeah. why sports betting you think sports betting money is one of the avenues students should explore or should be encouraged to explore to be financially independent and stable okay i wouldn't encourage um i wouldn't encourage it but um it is relative morality is relative people yeah. associate it to morality and all of that okay. everyone has a way he sees morality and sports betting um favors some people and doesn't favor some people. Mm. Some people use their school fees to bet. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and they blow. Yeah. Some people too. Hmm. <laughs> it's a tragedy. Yeah. So, um, gambling is not invested. Okay. It's not investment. It's it, not sh it shouldn't be considered as well. Yes. Or? It should. It is not. It to is me, not. it is not. Mm. And it is not. Yeah. Is not. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason being that like you, are, you are depending on luck. You are depending on luck to get that money. Say, 
so so and so team will score the so so and so team will that's score so, so his investor portfolio <laughs> they sit down and calculate their portfolio that yes. if this works you i get the value on the value and corporate it's like investing with a buyer it's quicker mm -hmm. within a day i can make that top up i i, I understand but um acquiring wealth is systematic okay it is not a one-time thing okay. sometimes it's not a happenstance yeah mm. sometimes people wake up to wealth they win a lottery mm -hmm. it doesn't happen to everyone but if you look at this, people, just a few, few of them actually blow. And the majority of them, they blow, then they lose, and that is it. They are not smart enough. The amount they get, say, 10,000, they are not smart enough to just take maybe um, 2,000 or 1,000 and say, this is the 1,000 I'm going to use for my other stakes they are not smart enough to do that they still take because they are greedy they take like half and more of it to stake again mm -hmm. and then they don't make it and then they do it again they don't make it and they live their lives or their wealth with uh, uh, to lack so this thing comes with a whole lot of twist mm -hmm. and i wouldn't encourage it actually mm -hmm. i have seen somebody really lost and <laughs> The person is going through hell now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I wouldn't encourage it personally. Mm. You should know who you are yeah. before you do <laughs> it. <laughs> I met this I was like, so I, I invest. What do you invest in? Sports betting. Oh. Of course. Sports, what is your view on that? Yeah, sports betting is not investment, just like said Nam said. Okay. It's speculation. Yeah. You have no control over the uh, thing that you are doing. You have no control over it. But investing is something you have control. Mm should have control so you can decide whether you can decide the amount of money you want to earn on your investment but for, for sp sports betting you don't have that control mm. so Liverpool my favorite team is playing with Chelsea yeah, and that, that, that's <laughs> my team to as well anyway. Chelsea yeah, you, you are saying Chelsea is going to score Liverpool but you know Liverpool is going to score Chelsea so it's it's speculation it can end up the other way around mm. and you can lose your money so and I also say, I always say that uh, get rich for sure okay. is better than get rich quick. Okay. <laughs> so you have to build your world over time. Mm. You don't need to, I want to be a millionaire over, overnight. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't happen that way. So, yeah, young people should, the only reason you should do sports betting is the amount of money that you can afford to lose. You should put the amount of money you can afford to lose into sports betting. So after you have created that world, after you have built a strong foundation, mm. you can decide to put the proceed in some mm. betting and whether you win or you lose, you know that oh I have a solid foundation. Yeah. Great. I believe that every student out there anybody out there who watched this program would have penned down a lot of things like wow this is coming from young professionals and the right people who should be saying this uh, is you uh, what advice should you have for students who are about to reopen school okay. uh, what should they be thinking about getting prepared for okay um in relation to world creation yes okay so as we said earlier get something that you can um, venture into go beyond the books go beyond the classes when you go to school think serve the internet see what people are doing there is person did it there is so much information there if you can brainstorm and put something out there search google you get something that you think no i can do this i can do this i can do this or maybe oh okay i can sell i can start selling chicken in school People will like it. I can start selling vitamin C in school. People will like it because this is the time for COVID-19. Mm. And don't try to um, follow the crowd by selling sanitizers or face masks. In fact, the market <laughs> is flooded. It's flooded. And this is no time for you. diversify. Look for something else to do. Mm. So I think that you should um, think about something you can do when you go back to school. A lot of a lot of us when it comes to finance yeah. being locked down for about 21 days or so it was hell for people so, bad. so 
you should think about the little you have and putting it aside for a rainy day. That is something I have to tell you. Perfect. Peter, okay. what have you got to tell students out there? All right. I, I, I wanted to take something when you were asking for source of funding, how we can raise money. One thing is you should also build trust, so trust equity. Uh, I wanted to sell suits on campus, and mm -hmm. there, was, there was this woman that I used to buy my suit from. Yeah. So I went to see her, and I spoke to her about it. Because she trusts me, she was able to give me her suit without me paying a penny for it. Mm -hmm. So once we build that trust with people, they can, we can also start something out of it. If you want to sell, let's say, bottled water, you can go see someone who is a wholesaler of that mm -hmm. item, build that trust with her, and you can start your business with that. Mm -hmm. So I will, I will, my final advice to young is the time for uh, thinking forward. You know, COVID-19 has really impacted businesses, individuals, and this is the time for us to plan ahead. Because most people are frustrated, most people are struggling now because they didn't plan for COVID-19. They didn't put something aside. So you don't know what will happen next. So this is the time for young people to start planning. Time for young people to start keeping any amount that comes to your hand. Mm -hmm. This is the time to build your world. This is the time to look into the future and build that strong foundation. Yeah. Because now you're alone and you don't have much responsibility. Your parents are giving you money and all that. Sure. But a day is coming. <laughs> you go for someone's daughter. Exactly. <laughs> you start giving birth. Exactly. So you need to plan for that day. Exactly. Yes. Thank you very much for all that you've seen, the, the impact you've made. I mean, your communities and also what you're doing for students and anybody who's available for your services all over the continent. I know the sky is just the beginning for you all. Yeah. And thanks very much for your time for watching. I want to say a big thank you to my production team who made it happen today. Great uh, production for every student out there. Thank you very much, EL, El, El Nils and Makeup, for the fantastic makeup you've done for us. And... I want to say a big thank you to anybody who had time to watch this show. I mean, bringing your comments and your contributions. This is something we need to support to carry the message to every student in the continent to be the best for the future. My name is Adimo Shudak on this African Student Voices. Keep watching African Student Voices on AAU TV and have a nice day. Bye. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280.
Hello and welcome to another interactive and educative episode of AAU Talks on AAU TV. My name is Ajaman Ochodako, and today our topic for you and for our discussion today is education in Africa, the case of pre tertiary students and schools in Africa, basically uh, the welfare of senior high schools in Africa. We believe this, that point in time is a deciding moment where students will either rise to universities or other technical universities to, to uh, gain more skills for the workforce. And if things are not done so well over there, how would that affect their future and their excellence in life? So today we have uh, on this interview, uh, Madame Adjoase, she is the project manager for learning support solutions in Ghana. And we'll be having a discussion with her on her point of view, her, her perspective towards education in Africa, the case of pre tertiary students in Africa. So if you can hear me, Madam Adwa say, you're welcome to AAU Talks. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you. And please Thank go you. on. All right, so let's start with the first one about uh, how you've seen senior high school education in Africa and COVID-19. We know it's been a big issue where students were asked to go home for a very long time and learning was a bit dormant. From your point of view, what did you observe the gap between this, these times with COVID-19 and then senior high schools in Africa? Well, I can only speak um, from the point of view of the NGO that I run. Right. And um, I, I work with primary schools and junior high schools. Okay. So, of course, I see the senior high school students when they have, you know, left, you know, what we do, you know, yeah. you know they have left um, the junior high school. And basically what we do is we try and train them as much as possible in um, learning how to use ICT for what they do. Sure. So we call it interactive teaching and learning with ICT. So when we first started, the idea was that they would have a very interactive session with their teachers, you know, and this would help in their, uh, um, in their with ICT. So we think it's to, to, for the child's own development, the child is able sometimes to, um, when I say child, I mean student, sorry. The child is able to learn at his or her own pace and find out things for his or herself, you know. So it's quite a, an interesting time, the JHS time, because this is when they need to decide whether, well, do I want to go for a straight academic course in university or do I want to do some vocational education and so on. So it's quite a, it's, it's, it's a very um, interesting time. Okay. Considering your NGO uh, Learning Support Solutions and you, the role you play there, can you give us uh, the background? What is Learning Support Solutions and how did it come about? Well, I used to work for ISA, um, Institute of Statistical Social Economic Research. I also worked in the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and an organization called um, the Technology Transfer Center. So okay. there we worked with industry more and we could see how the lack of knowledge of technology, you know, um, um, bothered the industrialists. They wanted to use more technology and so on. And then I worked for UNICEF. And when I'm working in UNICEF, I was um, the assistant project officer for education. Okay. So I saw a lot of schools again. And then I worked for the UN System Staff College. This was in Italy. And there we saw um, it was more UN staff trying to learn um, how to train other UN staff on some of Kofi Annan's, um, um, you know, new um, thoughts about training in the UN. So sure. training is very important, but for our particular case in the schools, we think it is a faster way of learning because we try and 
um, focus on um, the pupil and the teacher being in, in interactive roles rather than the teacher standing over the, the, the student and saying, repeat after me, repeat after me. So by the time they get to SHS, as you were saying, yes, it's a good time for them to know um, basically what they want to do, whether they want to go into science, whether they want to go into arts, and whether they want to go into um, university. Because there are lots of vocational institutes which are very, very um, well run now. So, you know, I come across some, quite a few students that I worked with in primary school who are now in vocational institutions and, and they prefer them. And so it's an interesting time, as you say, in SHS. It, it's, it's a sort of pivotal time when they would choose what exactly it is they want to do. And Wait, I think for what right, it does I beg your pardon. Yes, I was uh, pointing the issue of performance of these students in the senior high schools uh, in times like these. You have been able to make technology a common place for the students that you work with, uh, you, you, you have at the Learning Support Solutions Center. But we're looking at how technology and the use of computer laptops are that common in our senior high schools, unlike the universities that we have every student for a laptop for your uh, assignments and then online calls in these times. But how can we say it's in the case of senior high school students? Why don't we, what is your view in terms of infusing that much technology, the use of laptops and other gadgets in making learning uh, as usual, learning move on as usual, unlike the universities? Well, I think we have to be inventive. You know, I mean, I see nothing wrong in using secondhand computers. And um, currently, sure. the, the junior high schools, we work, junior high schools we work with, we have um, 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 desktops. I personally prefer desktops for schools, okay. not for any other reason that it's difficult to carry a desktop away. When there are laptops, it's like, oh, let me just take this home to check on something. You know, when it's a desktop, you can't take it home, you know, and put it in your, your means of transport and take it home. So we try, I mean, we learned by, you know, through the hard way that it's good to get desktops. And when they are secondhand, they are not so expensive. A friend of mine who lives in Europe, he's always saying, Ajwa, go and, go and wrestle the, you know, go and talk to the embassies and tell them to, and, and, and talk to Ghanaians in these countries and say to them, send them, send laptops to the, to the embassies yeah. and work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to force them to, to somehow send, you know, desktops back home because they are needed, you know. So I don't know whether I've answered the question properly, but we do need more um, technology, technological inputs. I, I met a gentleman who was head of the Korean Institute for Science and Technology. A long time ago when I was working in you know, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, and he told me, Madam, keep trying. Keep trying to provide things for your country. When I started, all my... Korean, you know, colleagues said, oh, this is too much hard work. Why are we always working for people we don't know and everything? And look where Korea is now. So to answer your question, but I'm not sure whether I've answered it properly, it does help if sure. you have hardware that is made available to students. And SHS is a pivotal time for them to do yeah. to decide what it is they want to do. Excellent. Um, this issue about uh, competence-based um, curricula, we have complaints that some of the curricula we have in our senior high schools are so the, the, the antique type, which are not really bringing out this, the competence. We don't see any interactive interaction in them. It's more of like the, the people type. We just read as a me type, not the one that we interact with. We don't have fun with what we learn. It's more of like just 
go get a book, read, and then move on. But do you think there's a need in, in, in the way to augment performance of students in senior high schools? We should have a much more robust activity-based, project-based curricula for our senior high schools from your perspective. What would you say to this? I think, well, you see, I, as I said, I, I'm not that um, experienced with senior high school. I have seen some of the curricula, but I think a lot of it depends on, um, as you say, the, 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 the books they use. And I can see it yeah. at the primary school level and the junior school level. Sometimes it's a bit academic, and sometimes it's, um, the English is kind of stiff. You know, so that by the time you begin to understand the English that is spoken, you know, the, 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 the chance to get the, the young person's attention is lost. But that's all to do with curriculum review and so on. And it is taking place. It is, a, a, you know, a continuous process. It's always taking place. Sure. So, um, the Ministry of Education does work quite hard on, on reviewing techno, um, um, curricula and seeing if it has been useful for the students. When I say students, I mean even class ones, you know, pupils. Yeah. The students, you know. So it is, um, I don't work with SHS, as I think I've said too often, but sure. it is a review that comes up um, regularly with the Ministry of Education. But I suppose it's, it's especially um, crucial at this point because after SHS, they need to decide what it is they want to do, whether they want to go to university or whether they want to Okay. Because he was Okay, Ajwa, we are glad to have you back on our interview and we want to proceed with what we were asking you earlier on. So yeah. tell, us, tell us about uh, Learning Support Solutions. The impact you are making on the students over there compared to senior high schools, how can we scale up what you're doing to that level? For the case study at Learning Support Solutions, what are some of the curricula the strategies you are using to build these young minds and how can that be scaled on to senior high school students in Africa from your perspective? I, one thing which um, I am not supposed to be speaking about but I don't think it happens at the SHS level okay. is corporal punishments. I think it is totally unnecessary. I think okay. it, it turns um, primary school students and second and JHS students away from school. Okay. But even at the SHS level, you know, yeah. you see, you come across some teachers who also say this child, well, or this young man misbehaved and he has to be caned. Mm -hmm. Now there are two schools of thought. Um, one school of thought is that by the very fact of our constitution and what our constitution shows, no child should be caned. Sure. And then there's another school of thought which says, oh, but technically it's legal and maybe it should be done only by the headmaster, but mm -hmm. some students need to be caned. 
I don't think we should have a climate of fear in our senior secondary schools. Yeah. Yes. And well, there should be a climate of people engaging to work together. Do you, do you think that uh, this corporal punishment aspect has anything to do when it comes to performance? Does it affect performance in any way? When, when what, I, I don't understand. Do you mean does it improve it or does it... Yeah, does it improve it performance of students in senior high schools or does it actually distract or, let's say, reduce performance? Because from your point of view, you eschew corporal punishment and you think that it builds the confidence of students to actually draw closer to their, uh, their, their teachers, tutors, and also give them that confidence to, to, to explore themselves more. However, you were saying that if we eliminate... Sure. So, uh, from your point of view, uh, eschewing um, corporal punishment has a role to play in building on the confidence of students to explore more. On the other hand, if we still continue with that, it actually subdues the confidence of these students and actually takes them away from the people they can be acquiring knowledge from. And I'm asking if the, 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 uh, uh, the punishment it being there or not has any role to play in terms of building the uh, students' performance, increasing their performance and making them much more excellent uh, on one way or the other? Well, I think it does. I think everybody behaves, they, when they are more relaxed, mm -hmm. you know, they behave better. But um, sometimes the proper punishment is, is, is carried out out of the classroom because of something that you know the student is perceived to have that be done yes. and it's very strange i know this i knew this gentleman he's no longer alive but he was one of our first um engineers and he was excellent at what he did and he said oh may i don't see what's wrong with the corporate punishment when i was a child and i couldn't remember my times table knowing that the the cane was there helped me improve my mind you know and so he said i've never you know, I never thought that it was a problem. But not everybody has, you know, a very sharp mind, a very skilled. So I think it doesn't do well for cooperation. It's, it's, it's difficult to cooperate with um, uh, um, children if they are feeling humiliated. Yeah. Or if they are feeling resentful. Okay. Yes, that's what I think. I know some people won't be, agree with me, but that's what I think. Sure, and this, though, we want your perspective. So regarding this case then, if we're trying to take technology to senior high schools to augment their performance, because COVID-19 taught the world a lesson, when these students were sent home, some people were not able to learn because they don't have the gadgets to do so. And we, we're not used to using these uh, gadgets to learn on campus, so... When one person has the, 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 the homework or the assignment, we'll have to share with everybody through some very unconventional means. Uh, how do you think technology can be, um, how, how do you think in this case, we can provide these machines and make it a working policy, like how universities do so? You complain about laptops getting missing, uh, but rather we should use desktops. How can, how can we uh, administer that in, in this case? Because COVID-19 means we should be far from each other for some distance and then have learning going on. on. We will need a device that which are mobile and not uh, stationary. So how can this happen in this case if we don't have laptops uh, available on these uh, campuses, but rather we have uh, desktop computers from your point of view? Yes. Oh, no. I mean, the, the desktop was just to show that, you know, if you're desperate and you know you can't afford laptops then go for desktops i mean that's what i was trying to say okay. but you know where there is a will there's a way um one of the schools i work with it's in it's sort of between nima and mamobi and it's very um they're very low income people but the teachers when the pandemic when the lockdown happened the teachers immediately started working with the jhs students they say you have to submit assignments, what happened? A few parents had smartphones. So the teachers 
would would meet i mean they would meet you know online and choose a subject and this subject um the topic was sent to the the parent who had a smartphone a small yes. smartphone but still a smartphone and yes. then it was sent to given to her child or his child who then communicated it to all the class children and they managed to write it. They had to write it out, you know, by themselves. They had to write it out. They had to, then a picture was taken of the, 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 the paper that the child had written. Yeah. It was then sent by, you know, mobile to the teacher. It was very laborious, but it worked. Great. It, so, it, there are some kinds of... I was so impressed. Kind of, I yeah. beg your pardon. Sure, uh, you, you don't end it. Yes, I said I was so surprised because the sort of thing I would say, oh, can you please do this? And can I had no idea. It was almost when it was the end of holidays that I said, what have you been doing with yourself? And they said, oh, we've been doing this. And I said, why didn't you tell me? They said, oh, I'm sorry, I mean, we don't want to worry you. And I said, but you need data because this is a lot yes. of data that is being sent back and forth. And then they started laughing. They said that after some time, the, the students started grumbling that, eh, it's enough. You know, all this, we, we are not even able to, the few smartphones that we have, we are not even able to, to, to look and, and look at Chatawale and what, what kind of life is this? So unless you bribe us with data, we are not going to do any more work. So, so they bribed them. But I think it was a bribe. I don't approve of bribery, but this was a good, the good type of bribery. So, you know, it's, it's difficult when things are hard, when, you know, you have to, you know, the, 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 as a long time ago, somebody said, the sparker won't spark, the generator won't gen. To tell teachers, oh, try, try, try and look for methods. But, you know, you never know when the child that you help today will be the child who will save your life on a, on, in a hospital tomorrow. Sure. You know, so, this, so this was a completely, you know, we are the ones who are always talking about, you know, use what we have. But these teachers just went ahead and did this. So they got a lot of work done during the pandemic. And of course, it means there wasn't much social distancing. But even now, if you go to Nima, there's not that much social distancing, and they seem fine. We, we have a concept called the bring your own device uh, concept, where you have your own device, you bring it to school, and then you study with it, and then you take it back. Do you think this system will work in a place like a pre-tertiary level with students who are not managed or not deemed to be fully matured to handle their own affairs. Unlike uh, the tertiary institutions where we are autonomous, we are on our own, but at the senior high level, they are still under some control, which actually subdues their ability to think on their own and critically analyze things for themselves. Do you think uh, there should be this big change to turn them around to be people who think on their feet to... Uh, make their own decisions about the academics in this case. Um, can you, I, I didn't get that. You said so, um, the issue is that they yet, should be able to bring their own, their own their device, device, yes. And their, then bring it back. Yes, their own device for learning and then take it back, like how we do in universities. But there are some uh, arguments that they are not yet matured. They will not use it for the learning. They will use to watch videos and other things that don't connote for learning. Uh, how can we debunk this kind of um, perceptions that they are not mature to make their own decisions when it comes to academia? And so we still go back to traditional ways of learning for them whilst we could use the bring your own device method. What is your uh, point of view to this? I mean, personally, I think discussion is always very useful, you know. It's always extremely useful, and you would be surprised at what um, young people can make up their mind to do. But in this case, it would involve, you know, speaking with their, their guardians. 
But sure. that's why we have um, staff meetings. You know, I, I don't think it would be such a bad idea. The problem is whether the child themselves will have time to do homework. What, what level would this be? What year? Well, it, it can start at the first year. All they need, I, I think all they need is the, the right orientation and the data, uh, data provision. That, that's all they need, the security for their devices. No, uh, yes, senior high school level one. Oh, yes, I think they would. I think they are mature enough, but it's always useful to bring in guardians and parents. I'm a great, I'm a great believer in, you know, uh, proper st uh, meetings with the staff and with guardians to say, this is what we are doing now. We... It is an experiment. We count on you to make sure that, or to ensure that, you know, this is being used um, for the right things and that the child will bring it back. I, I don't like using the word child, but, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to, to distinguish between um, the, the carer and the students. Exactly. I, I, you know, discussion when you, discussions are always very, very useful. If you just make a, a law and say this should happen, I mean, it sounds good, but when you back it with discussions, when you back it with um, 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 notes which are written down, when it, I think it's useful. True. I would say it would be useful. That is great. The problem with some children is that they don't have time, you know, it, especially if they come from very poor communities in, in urban areas, poor communities, you know, where they are supposed to sell things. And, you know, so it's an issue of time. But all these things are things which can be put on the table for discussion. You know, things can be discussed. For instance, in rural areas, you know, sometimes they, they you know, um, um, communities have problems because they have to um, do planting or they have to do harvesting at a particular time. And the teacher will say, no, 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 this is the time you should be in school. But in the Ghana Education Service, there are, it is quite acceptable for a community to say, this is not the right time um, for us to let all our children go and nobody's going to be harvesting, helping us to harvest. So we want to postpone it. You know, discussion is very, very useful when it comes to education. Sure. Yes. Thank you very much. Exactly. I want us to wrap up basing on the experience you have at Learning Support Solutions. I, you have quite a great uh, method of learning with, these, with, your, with your children and the way they learn very faster with technology that you have introduced in there. If you were to suggest something new that could encircle the entire senior high uh, sector, let's say in the whole of Africa, Africa, when it comes to the pre tertiary level, what would you want us, uh, government policymakers, to start preparing to institute into the learning uh, curricula or learning mode when it comes to pre-tertiary level to boost performance because right from there they are going to universities what do they need in terms of your perspectives what should we institute to these levels for them to be very very functional when it comes to the the, the tertiary levels and also for the job field if you were to advise I would, I would promote discussion at the at the classroom level okay instead of what we call you know chalk and talk where you take a chalk and you write on the blackboard and the child has to repeat. We sometimes ask students, what do you, what makes it difficult for you to come to school? And well, the number one thing that they said was caning. We asked two separate schools. They, they just said, sometimes you get up in the morning and you say, I'm not going to school because something will happen. The teacher will be a bad with the friend. But Another thing that they liked was they didn't like being bored. And when you have to copy 
and then take it before you take it home and then then no it's good to have discussions you know in some schools what they do is instead of individual desks they they have um, desks as in you know you see in class one where they they work together and they discuss together yeah I think, and it's the same in university. I think sometimes you just assume that, oh, class three, four, way four, you know, if you let them, they'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. They won't yeah. discuss. But I think um, teaching the child or, you know, exposing the child to a situation where they actually discuss with somebody else next to them and then somebody reports on their behalf. It's also very useful. When we do brainstorming, we call it brainstorming. Sure. We have a, a situation where we, we, there are certain rules and one rule is that nobody gets laughed at. Yeah. You don't know, there's no laughter at all. Whatever anybody says, nobody gets laughed at. Um, any, you don't even raise your hand. You just shout, if the teacher has a problem, you shout it out, the teacher writes it down, it's, it's discussed by everybody. And this was done in a class, three class, oh, no class, the teacher came back to report. He said it was amazing. I mean, everybody um, um, contributed. Usually there are some children who never contribute. Sure. But whether it was, you knowing that you, everybody contributed, there was laughter, and she said that, and we finish the lesson much faster than we usually do. We finish it really less faster. I mean, less, okay. less um, faster than we usually do. So discussions are useful. You know, children may not be used to, or students may not be used to having um, 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 this kind of thing, but they complain about just sitting and looking forward and talk and talk, you know, this is, it appeals to their sense of being adults. I think it's a good idea. Great, great. Thank you very much, Madam Ajua Say, for your time and for your submissions on how we, could, we can enhance education in the pre level with technology and also a much more interactive uh, educational mode and not the other way around. Thank you very much for your time. Do you have any final message you want to bring on board? All right. And sorry about sorry about Rashidi Lights. Exactly. Rashidi <laughs> yeah, we are glad we are glad you made it back okay. to the show. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for watching the show All on right. AU Talks by and we had um, Madame Adwa say she is the project manager for the Learning Support Solution Center in Ghana, a great institution that is really ro roping in technology to help promote education and enhance uh, technical ed education when it comes to technology learning and all that. And it's good having her on, on the show to discuss how we can also rub in technology and other educational methods to help build our pre tertiary levels in Africa and also Ghana as well. Thank you very much for watching. You're bringing your comments and also how you can also contribute to the discussion how we could also use technology to improve education in Africa with regards to the pre tertiary levels in Africa. My name is Ajamal Chudakon, and I was your host on AU Talks. Uh, tune in for more programs on AU Talks on AU TV. Have a nice day and bye. I'm here with the Association of African Universities Television, AUTV. I just want to say that uh, without the media, you won't know what's going on in the world. Even with the media, you sometimes don't know what's going on in the world. So you need to tune in to the reliable sources who are really on the front lines, who can give you the information you need and give you facts, uh, not conjecture, give you real news, not fake news. And this is the place to find it, AUTV. The voice of higher education in Africa.
Hello Africa, you are watching Event Updates on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Updates brings you information about upcoming higher education events happening in Africa and it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. I am Isabella Tzahinakwa. Shumapela Elisamukha Mpabadansa. You may not have heard about us, but we have heard about you. You've been searching for a new kind of university that matches your ambition. Our world-class education is renowned, but there is more to us. Meet the university in Ghana that is transforming Africa. One that is nurturing a new generation of ethical, entrepreneurial leaders. One that offers scholarships thanks to the Massacre Foundation, so that you can be part of our community of students who stand for integrity, discipline, and excellence. There is only one such university, only one, where 100% of graduates receive job offers or graduate school admissions. You may not have heard about us, but we have heard about you. You are Africa's future, and we are Ashesi University College. Together, we can begin to create a new Africa. Harvard University is calling for applications for the Harvard University Academy Scholars Program 2021, which identifies and supports outstanding scholars at the start of their careers. Individuals with resourcefulness, initiative, curiosity, and originality whose work in cultures or region outside of the U.S. or Canada shows promise as a foundation for exceptional careers in major universities or international institutions will be selected. This application is open to recent PhD or comparable professional school degree recipients and doctoral candidates in the social sciences or law. Those still pursuing a PhD should have completed their routine training and be well along in the writing of their thesis before applying. Applications are welcome from qualified persons without regard to nationality, gender or race. Interested applicants should apply with a cover letter CV, research proposal, a copy of your PhD program transcript, as well as three letters of recommendation, all in PDF, to application inquiries at wcfia.harvard.edu before 1st October 2020. L'Université de Harvard lance un appel à candidature pour le programme de bourse d'études 2021 de Harvard University Academy qui identifie et soutient des universitaires exceptionnels au début de leur carrière. Des individus dotés de dynamisme, d'initiative, de curiosité et d'originalité dans le travail dans des cultures ou des régions en dehors des États-Unis ou du Canada s'avèrent prometteurs comme base pour des carrières exceptionnelles dans de grandes universités ou une institution internationale seront sélectionnés. Cette application est ouverte aux titulaires récents d'un doctorat ou d'un diplôme d'école professionnel comparable et les doctorants en sciences sociales ou en droit. Ceux qui poursuivent encore leur doctorat doivent avoir terminé leur formation de routine et être bien avancés dans la rédaction de leur thèse avant de postuler. Les candidatures de personnes qualifiées sont les bienvenues sans distinction de nationalité, de sexe ou de race. Les candidats intéressés doivent postuler avec une lettre de motivation, un CV, une proposition de recherche, une copie du relevé de notes de votre, euh, du programme de doctorat ainsi que trois lettres de recommandation, le tout en PDF à applicationinquiries.wcfia.havad.edu avant le 1er octobre 2020. Applications are open for the World Academy of Sciences TWAS Fellowships for Research and Advanced Training 2020 for young scientists in developing countries to enable them to spend 3 to 12 months at a research institution in a developing country other than their own. This is to enhance the research capacity of promising scientists, especially those at the beginning of their research career, helping them to foster links for further collaboration. Eligible applicants should be young scientists holding at least an MSc or equivalent degree, working in any area of natural sciences who are citizens of a developing country and are employed by a research institution in a developing country. Interested applicants can apply online with a scanned copy of their passport, CV, two reference letters of senior scientists familiar with your work, supporting statements from head of home institution, 
MSc certificate and relevant university transcripts, as well as official invitation letter from the head of the host institute before 1st October 2020. Application should be sent via email to exchanges at tours.org or info at tours.org. You can also visit www.tours.org slash opportunity for more information. Les candidatures sont ouvertes pour l'édition 2020 des bourses de recherche et de formation avancées de l'Académie mondiale des sciences TWAS pour les jeunes scientifiques des pays en voie de développement afin de leur permettre de passer 3 à 12 mois dans une institution de recherche dans un pays en voie de développement autre que le leur. Ceci vise à renforcer la capacité de recherche des scientifiques prometteurs, en particulier ceux qui sont au début de leur carrière de chercheurs en les aidant à nouer des liens en vue d'une collaboration future. Les candidats éligibles doivent être de jeunes scientifiques titulaires d'une maîtrise ou d'un diplôme équivalent, travaillant dans n'importe quel domaine des sciences naturelles, citoyens, d'un pays en voie de développement et employés par un institut de recherche dans un pays en voie de développement. Les candidats intéressés peuvent postuler en ligne avec une copie numérisée de leur passeport, CV, de l'aide de référence de scientifiques chevronnés, familiers avec votre travail, une attestation du chef de l'établissement d'origine, un certificat de maîtrise et un relevé de notes universitaires pertinents, ainsi qu'une lettre d'invitation euh, officielle du chef de l'institut hôte avant le 1er octobre 2020. Les candidatures doivent être envoyées par courriel électronique à exchange.org ou info.org. Vous pouvez également visiter www.toas.org bar opportunity pour plus d'informations. Applications are open for the Women for Africa Foundation Science by Women Program 2020 to promote African women's leadership in scientific research and technology transfer and to foster the capacity of the research centers in their home countries. This program will enable African women researchers and scientists to tackle the great challenges faced by Africans through research in health and biomedicine, sustainable agriculture and food security water, energy and climate change. Interested applicants must be a woman, national of an African country, have a PhD with at least three years of postdoctoral professional experience, solid working knowledge of English, as well as proven experience leading a research group. Qualified applicants should submit letter of interest, CV, filled application forms, passports, PhD diploma and research proposal in English via the Science by Women microsite before 30th September 2020. Kindly email science.by.women at newjaexpoafrica.es for more information. La Fondation Women for Africa lance la sixième édition du programme Science by Women dans le but de promouvoir le leadership des femmes africaines dans la recherche scientifique et le transfert de technologie et de renforcer la capacité des centres de recherche dans leur pays d'origine. Cette fondation vise à permettre aux femmes chercheurs et scientifiques africaines de relever les grands défis auxquels l'Afrique est confrontée à travers la recherche en santé et biomédecine, en agriculture durable et sécurité alimentaire, en eau, en énergie et en changement climatique. Chaque centre accueillera une chercheuse ayant au moins trois ans d'expérience postdoctorale pour une bourse de six mois. Les candidatures seront soumises à un processus de sélection rigoureux évaluant les mérites académiques et le leadership des candidats ainsi que la qualité scientifique et l'impact attendu de leur projet de recherche. L'intéressé doit être une femme, doit être d'un pays africain, titulaire d'un doctorat avec au moins trois ans d'expérience professionnelle postdoctorale, avoir un excellent dossier académique et une expérience avérée de la recherche pertinente une solide connaissance pratique de l'anglais ainsi qu'une expérience avérée à la tête d'un groupe de recherche. Les candidats intéressés doivent visiter le lien qui s'affiche sur l'écran pour soumettre leur proposition avant le 30 septembre 2020. Vous envoyer un courriel à science.by.women.arobas.nujarespoafrica.es pour plus d'informations. The National Endowment for Democracy, NED, is calling for application for the NED Reagan Vassal Democracy Fellows Program 2021 to 2022. This program supports democratic activists, scholars, and journalists around the world to conduct independent research 
build individual capacity and exchange ideas to strengthen democratic development in their countries, regional fields of expertise. All qualified applicants should demonstrate proficiency in the English language, propose a project focusing on the political, social, economic, legal or cultural aspects of democratic development and be available to work in residence at the International Forum for Democratic Studies in Washington, D.C. during the five-month fellowship period. First, create an account through an online portal and submit application information, project proposal, letters of recommendation and CV in English. Visit www.net.org or email info at net.org for more information. The National Endowment for Democracy, NED, lance un appel à candidature pour le programme NED Reagan Facer Democracy Fellows 2021-2022. Ce programme aide les militants, démocrates, les universitaires et les journalistes du monde entier à mener des recherches indépendantes, à renforcer les capacités individuelles et à échanger des idées pour renforcer le développement démocratique dans leur pays, région ou domaine d'expertise. Tous les candidats qualifiés doivent avoir une maîtrise de la langue anglaise, proposer un projet axé sur les aspects politiques, sociaux, économiques, juridiques ou culturels du développement démocratique et être disponible pour travailler en présidence au Forum international pour les études démocratiques à Washington DC pendant la période de la bourse de 5 mois. Créez d'abord un compte via un portail en ligne et soumettez les informations de candidature, la proposition de projet, les lettres de recommandation et le CV doivent être en anglais. Veuillez visiter www.nd.org ou envoyer un courriel à info.basned.org pour plus d'informations. The African University of Science and Technology, AUST, is calling for application for admission into full-time master's program 2021 to 2022 session. This program offers full-time master's, weekend degree programs and a year coursework program. Candidates with minimum of second class upper or its equivalent undergraduate degree will be considered for admission in addition to a satisfactory performance in an entrance examination. Interested applicants should complete the application form and submit on the link on your screen before 30th September 2020. For more information, email admission at ausd.edu.ng or call plus 234-907-034-3070 or plus 234-907-034-3088. You can also visit www.ausd.edu slash admission. L'Université africaine des sciences et technologies, AUST, lance un appel à candidature pour l'admission à la session 2021-2022 du programme de maîtrise à temps plein. Ce programme propose des masters à temps plein, des programmes de fin de semaine et un programme de travail d'un an. Les candidats avec une mention de second classe à pas ou d'un diplôme de premier cycle équivalent seront considérés pour l'admission en plus d'une performance satisfaisante à un examen d'entrée. Les candidats intéressés doivent compléter leur formulaire de candidature et soumettre sur le lien s'affichant sur l'écran avant le 30 septembre 2020. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez envoyer un email à admission.aust.edu.ng ou appeler le plus 234 90 70 34 30 70 ou le plus 234 90 70 34 30 88. Vous pouvez également visiter www.aust.edu/admission. That is all for today's update. The event update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platform, the universities on Facebook and YouTube. AAU TV underscore African Universities on Twitter and AAU TV official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of event updates. I am Isabella Tatahina Kwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Ampaba Johnson.
Hello and welcome to Health Afric on AAU TV. AAU TV is the voice of higher education in Africa, and Health Afric is your favorite health show on television today. My name is Twenty. It commences from the 18th to the 24th of November each year, and it aims to increase awareness of global antimicrobial resistance and to encourage better practices among the general public and to avoid further emergence of drug resistant infections. The theme for this year is uniting to preserve antimicrobials statistics from the CDC Center for Disease Control and Prevention says that in the US alone 2.8 million people have come into contact with antibiotic resistant infections and out of that same number 35,000 people are dying each year as a result of this this is just the US imagine what is happening in other parts of the world on other continents when it's brought together it's just unimaginable you have a reason to stay tuned my name is Bridget Amadenta once again I'll be back and then I'll introduce my wonderful guests do stay tuned Welcome back. This again is Health Africa on AAU TV. If you just joined the conversation, you're not late. You can follow the conversation on Facebook, Association of African Universities, on YouTube, Association of African Universities, and do well to check out our Twitter and Instagram handles. There's a lot there. So my guests for today are Ebenezer Ajari Bidiako. He is a superintendent pharmacist. In fact, I didn't know that there was a superintendent pharmacist. And then I also have Selassie Thelma Amadumako. She is also a pharmacist here in Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's a much. privilege to have you here today. Yeah, I know it's going to be a very interesting conversation because we've already talked about <laughs> it in background. Like yeah, in the background. So. Yes. So I'll start off. What is an antimicrobial and what are the types there are? Okay, so... Ladies, Ladies first, so. mm -hmm. I'll go first. Okay, so when we talk about antimicrobials, they are a group of drugs that kill or inhibit pathogenic microorganisms. Okay. When I say pathogenic, I mean microorganisms that cause harm okay. to the body. Okay, so examples are bacteria, mm -hmm. fungi, viruses, and protozoa. Okay. okay, so examples of antimicrobials are antibacterials mm -hmm. those are the common ones we know mm -hmm. like amoxicillin fluclosacillin and we have antifungals um like griseofulvin and terbinafin mm -hmm. um, fluconazole wow, that's okay. and we have antiprotozoans metronidazole all these fall under the um antimicrobials okay yes. okay so when we say antibiotics what what are they what are antibiotics yeah, so basically, um, with the <coughs> definition she gave, um, mm -hmm. zooming into antibiotics, antibiotics in general are uh, um, medications okay, that are designed to kill bacteria. Mm -hmm. okay, so basically, that is the definition that I'll give to antibacteria. Okay, okay, okay. okay. What, what would you say is the best way to use antimicrobials? Antimicrobials. Okay, so um, antimicrobials, okay, as the name um, goes, they are designed specifically for a purpose, mm -hmm. okay, to target microorganisms, okay, microorganisms that can cause harm to, to the human body. And so the best practices, okay, for using antimicrobials are when it's being prescribed for the right purpose, prescribed by a qualified practitioner because they know why they, are, they need to prescribe these antibiotics. And of course, because it's designed for a purpose, it's for a particular duration. Okay. And so if it's used within the required duration and mm -hmm. also the required amount, okay, those are ways that, I mean, you can rightly use antimicrobials. Uh, okay. Okay. okay, so the theme for this year's celebration of the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week is um, united to preserve antimicrobials. What goes into it? What? 
What are the intricacies? Yeah, so um, United to preserve antimicrobials. Over the years, what we see is that anytime we are, t we are having this discussion, I mean, in regards to antimicrobials, we tend to look at only the, um, the lay person, okay, or the general public. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we realize that other sectors also come to play. We are looking at the prescribers and also the policy makers. We all need to come together to, I mean, uh, uh, make sure that antimicrobials are being used mm -hmm. well. Because if the prescriber is overly prescribing and, and, and they are, I mean, they are just um, prescribing their medications as and when they feel like, mm -hmm. of course, it will be very difficult for the lay person to also, I mean, desist from taking it. The lay person will think that it's been prescribed, okay, and also I need to take it. The, 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 the policy makers also need to come in to make sure that there are no spurious or substandard medications mm -hmm. or antimicrobials out there. If they are all playing their role together, okay, we can all come together to tackle this fight against uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Okay. okay yes, and and to throw more light on what he said, um, these kind of awarenesses shouldn't be done on a yearly basis, okay? They should be done, in my opinion, on a monthly basis, so as to create the seriousness of the awareness, because it's something that we always need to remember. If it's done on a yearly basis, who knows? It will be there for a short time, and after a while, everyone has forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. We go back to our old practices. So yes, they should be done regularly, and even it can start with our community pharmacies. Mm -hmm. okay. We as health professionals, we are on the front line of this whole thing. So it is our duty, every pharmacist out there, and even um, doctors, nurses, it's our duty to educate the patients and the public mm -hmm. on um, antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay, we make them understand the implications of abusing these antimicrobials or antibiotics so that they know what they are getting into, okay. okay, so as to minimize or avoid yeah. um, antimicrobial resistance. Okay, so you mentioned antibiotic resistance. What is antibiotic resistance? Okay, so when we say antibiotic resistance, we are talking about when a bacteria or let me say a microbe, mm -hmm. okay, a microorganism mm -hmm. develops the ability to overcome or to defeat the effect of an anti biotic mm -hmm. the antibiotic that was supposed to treat it mm -hmm. it overcomes the ability of that antibiotic okay. that is when antibiotic resistance occurs mm -hmm. or when the antibiotic loses its ability to combat the microorganism okay. the pathogenic microorganism so it works both okay. ways okay and for which infections like which infections are caused by viruses and shouldn't be treated with antibiotics you already talked about antibiotics so which uh, infection shouldn't be treated with these things yeah so um normally viral infections okay mm -hmm. we have i mean colds flu and i mean other viral infections that we know mostly they are not to be treated with antibiotics because antibiotics haven't been designed mm -hmm to target um, these viruses and so if you are using them to target these viral infections it's like you are rendering them useless oh. and over time i mean you you build people build resistance to it yeah, okay. because it wasn't it's not supposed to be used for that mm. purpose yeah. okay why, why should i even care about antibiotic resistance like yeah antibiotic resistance now is <laughs> it's become one of the world's most urgent threats mm -hmm. okay because um, we realize that conditions that were easily treated with antibiotics now, um, they, are, they, are, they are no longer being treated. Uh, I mean, you can't treat them with these antibiotics that we have. And it's because of a practice that has um, existed over time. Okay, um, now it's very difficult to treat certain conditions and it's more expensive to treat certain conditions. Unlike uh, previously where you could just take um, um, a simple antibiotic and then I mean you are well now if that antibiotic resistance is becoming a threat and if you are not careful it will get to a time that all the antibiotics will be done and we can't even get some to use and I mean it's going to cause a lot of problems to us mm. but why are they becoming resistant to it I mean you are a bacteria there's a drug so at least when you take you you should be able to clear up the system how, how are they being able to become resistant and why Okay, so 
let me just start on a general note mm -hmm. okay first and foremost i think it's important that everyone knows there are different types of resistance okay, okay. there's the inherent one and there's the acquired one okay when I say inherent, I mean um, there are some bacteria or microbes that naturally, naturally speaking, naturally, they are resistant to antibiotics because okay. of their physiological makeup. Mm -hmm. That one is just natural. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay. And there is also the acquired one. The acquired one has to do with um, microbes that were once sensitive to the antibiotic they were once sensitive to antibiotic but have become have developed that ability to overcome them due to overuse and misuse of antibiotics or let me just say abuse of antibiotics okay mm -hmm. so now we are coming to why they become mm -hmm. resistant okay so I'll, i i like to use examples there are ways i explain things better so here lies the case where you have been prescribed an antibiotic and you're supposed to take it for the full course. Maybe you're supposed to take it for seven days. And maybe after like three days or four days, you take it and you're feeling better. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, let me just, yeah. I'm feeling better. Mm -hmm. So let me just stop taking it. Mm -hmm. This is another way. This is a way resistance can occur because you haven't finished killing the infection. And then you are giving the bacteria the chance to strategize because they've been exposed to the antibiotic mm -hmm. and since you didn't finish killing them off they'll now strategize um, a way to now overcome it mm -hmm. okay and another common misuse or mishap that people usually do is they tend to take antibiotics for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. i mean i've worked in a community pharmacy so i know they come to the pharmacy and they have a stomach pain they have a headache and they want to take antibiotics some of them, they don't even feel anything. They are like, they want antibiotics. They demand for it. Why? Because they want to cleanse their system. I've never heard that before as a health professional. Okay. So these are some of the reasons. And one of the most common illnesses that uh, antibiotics are taken for are um, cold, mm -hmm. common cold and flu. These are viral infections. Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, rhinoviral infections. You don't take antibiotics for viral infections. You don't take antibacterials for viral infections. Okay, so these are some of the mishaps, mm. okay, okay, that can lead to um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. And another thing that is also not common is we have agriculture, in the agricultural sector, the people that read the poultry mm -hmm. and all that and the fish they are into fisheries and all that they tend to give these uh, animals antibiotics sometimes yeah, to get bigger yes <laughs> not necessarily to get bigger but to prevent mm. infections okay okay i heard someone Just to say keep they them give healthy. it to them to get bigger I mean, you christmas see? is coming yeah. <laughs> exactly all these funny funny practices and then we ask ourselves that where did they even hear all these things from mostly as hearsays and all that but these are some of the more practices that lead to um antimicrobial resistance, anti okay. resistance. Okay. Even yeah, 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 so to add to what she's saying um like i said this time around we are also looking at the health workers okay <laughs> they need to prescribe sometimes you realize that um some of the antibiotics prescribed are not necessary okay and if you prescribe that way it makes it very difficult for you the pharmacist or I mean you the the, the one who's who um, supposed to give out the medication to explain to the patient that no you don't need this probably let's drop this or that mm. so we need to look at that 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 angle and also in Ghana here uh, I mean in our setting we are fond of taking medications that have been prescribed for people mm -hmm. because it works for I mean person A I can also take it yeah. mm -hmm. well, I don't need it okay we realize that it goes on a lot uh, I mean, from where I practice, I normally see this. They come in demanding for all sort of antibiotics because someone has used it and it worked. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most of them are also local folks. They've been using these antibiotics for over a time now, and they think that that's what helps them. And so when they come to you, they demand that you also give them, I mean, the same thing that they are requesting for. You realize that most of them are taking it for funny reasons. Others mix it with so, all sort of concussions and then they take it and it, 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 it's that bad. All these practices is what has led to 
I mean, there's antibiotic resistance. Prevention is better than cure. So I want to prevent getting sick, so I'll take <laughs> antibiotics or antimicrobials. I know you've done some before because I have. I'm also a culprit, so please stay tuned. I'll be back. And then when we are going on a break, we are going to show you a video of um, samples of what people think about antimicrobials, their views and then their thoughts. Do watch the video. The pharmacist will speak to it afterwards. In observing the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week 2020, I wish to contribute that I am fortunate to have known about antimicrobial resistance back in school days by a physical education tutor. And ever since my knowledge about that, I barely take in antimicrobials. And if at any point I have to, it has to be prescribed by a medical practitioner. Basically, I maintain good health practices and also in uniting to preserve antimicrobials, I Anoko Ado regularly entreat family and friends to desist from abuse of antimicrobials. Thank you. back from the break i hope you enjoyed the comments for we had from people and thank you so much docas and for sending in your video and i know the animation also summarizes the whole conversation we are having today you should know how to protect yourself and don't just be taking antibiotics before we left off on the break i was on the point of um prevention is better than cure there are instances where i'm like okay i'm about to travel let me take care of myself i take an antibiotic and then I'm like, okay, so I'm fine, I can go. And I do this on a monthly basis. What am I exposing myself to? Yeah, so like I said from the beginning, antibiotics are, are not just um, prescribed, they are not just given to you because you f the, um, the prescriber feels you need it or you feel you need it. They are not over the counter, I mean, medications. So this is where we need to keep on educating the public that they need to know that there are classes of medications, okay? You can't just walk to your healthcare practitioner and demand an antibiotic because you want to cleanse yourself or protect yourself like you are saying um, at any point in time when it needs to be issued there has to be an assessment to to I mean to know if you actually need it or not mm -hmm. so there are instances where um, <laughs> uh, from where I work uh, people come in and then sometimes the ladies they come in and they tell you that probably they are done with their menses and so they need um, some antibiotics to cleanse themselves, you know, fluconazole and all these uh, um, uh, antifungals that we have. And, and, and they, they don't know what they're exposing them, themselves to. What happens is anytime you take antibiotics, okay, you are, they are exposing yourself to resistance. There are instances where um, the, the, the microorganisms in there, some may be sensitive to the antibiotic that you are taking. Others may not be sensitive, they will resist. And over time, now begin to multiply, okay, and they begin to take over, I mean, your system. At a point when you actually need an antibiotic, we give it to you and it doesn't work because mm -hmm. you've built resistance over time. Mm -hmm. So taking antibiotics because you are traveling or taking antibiotics because you want to protect yourself, like you said, is not um, a good practice. We should desist from that, actually. Okay. Yeah, so okay. that's what I like to say in regards to Yes, and to um, add to what he's saying, um, antibiotic resistant bacteria are very difficult to treat okay so 
this is a reason why we must really prevent this whole antibiotic um, resistant things because some of them even lead to life-threatening conditions i mean in some cases they lead to death and they are also very expensive to treat so these are some of the reasons why we are trying our possible best to um, combat antimicrobial resistance mm. or antibiotic resistance. Okay. I'd like to give a few examples okay. of some sure. antibiotic resistant bacteria. We have um, MRSA, that is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. First and foremost, Staphylococcus aureus is a bacteria that naturally lives on mm -hmm. the skin. Okay on healthy people okay. so it's like yeah it's normal but imagine when this bacteria becomes resistant to a lot of um antibiotics you, you get it mm -hmm. and there's a lot of it in your on your body mm -hmm. you get it so once it invades your system yeah. it can lead to um uh, cases like boils mm -hmm. okay it can cause formation of boils that's Normal antibiotics cannot even treat. You oh. need surgery. Okay. You need them to be drained, so and you need surgery. Reversed. Yeah. So something like this, it's it will be an expensive yeah. cause. Sometimes too, they cause um, when they enter into the bloodstream, they can cause sepsis or bacteri bactericemia. That's mm -hmm. bacteria in the blood, okay. which is also um, time consuming. It's yeah time consuming to treat expensive. and definitely expensive and we have other microorganisms like um, streptococcus pneumoniae mm -hmm. this particular bacteria is is also an antibiotic resistant bacteria it causes um, pneumonia infection in the lungs and in serious cases it can lead to conditions such as infections of the heart and the the, the kidneys and all so these are some of the things you are trying to prevent. That's, when, that's what I mean when I say life-threatening yeah. diseases. Do you get me? Yeah. Uh, is that serious? And there is also one common one. Okay. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. That's the bacteria that's n that causes gonorrhea. Okay. Okay. And this one can lead to ectopic pregnancy. That's um, pregnancy that doesn't grow. The, the fetus yeah. doesn't grow inside the womb. It grows outside the womb which is very very dangerous when you have that kind of pregnancy they have to operate on you and take it out and that bacteria can cause that and it can also cause infertility and increase the risk of hiv mm. yeah so these are examples these are just tip of the iceberg like examples it that means we are joking we are really joking we are really joking and the people out there sometimes they don't make it easy for us health professionals because if you've worked in a pharmacy setting, I mean, I've had personal experiences where people come in and they say they demand for an antibiotic. And you ask them, what are you using it for? They get offended because they feel you're not supposed to be asking them that question, you know. But it's, it's because they don't know. Yes, it's personal. Some of them won't even tell you, but mm -hmm. they want it. Mm -hmm. Some too, they'll be prudent enough to tell you that, oh, I've been taking it for this, I've been taking it for that. That's when you can actually chip in your expertise and yeah. tell them that, oh, no, this is how it's supposed to be done. And to take them like you're taking vitamins or painkillers, okay, that's when we educate them. Some of them actually do listen. Mm -hmm. Others, too, are very difficult yeah. in all that. So I think that by and by, mm -hmm. as we keep making this awareness small, concrete mm -hmm. they'll get to learn take note of okay okay i skipped the part where the video you have to comment on the video so okay uh, here, that, let's come back to that what sure. do you have to say about the video that doc has sent in because she seems like someone who is privy to knowledge about antibacteria yeah yeah she was um actually uh, making reference to the fact that she knows about antibiotic yeah, resistance knows. back in school days it's good Mm -hmm. um, we, we should ask ourselves how many people mm. know it and even those who know it how many people actually put it to use because it's another thing knowing and then practicing or putting it to use some people you do all the talking and then they go back to their old ways yeah. what we need to do or what we need to realize is antibiotic resistance um, has become a threat mm -hmm. to the world at large okay. and so um, nobody um, is spared 
And so if we, uh, we are not taking some of these things into use and we are just talking about it, we will still keep talking about it and the problem will keep, keep on increasing. So for her, yes, that's good. She has an idea, she has knowledge about it, but it shouldn't end there. When, I mean, they go to the health practitioners, they should still seek for more information mm -hmm. and then know how best, I mean, they can, we can all, I mean, solve this and tackle this. Okay. Like we said, the theme is uniting, yes, okay, uniting. to preserve these antimicrobial, uh, to preserve these uh, antimicrobial. Antimicrobial. So we all need okay. to come in hand in hand and play our role to help. Okay, yeah. okay. So how, we are coming to the end here, how should anyone use antibiotics to protect themselves and that of the community? Yeah, so um, using antibiotics to protect yourself, um, it depends on what angle uh, you are coming from. Okay. okay, like I said, antibiotics are not just given over the counter. Yeah. So before it's issued, one, you need to know if you need antibiotic or not, and that should be done by a healthcare professional. They are supposed to access you mm -hmm. and know if you actually need it. One, you are supposed to um, know the duration in which you are taking your antibiotics and also the required amount or the dosage because mm -hmm. you can't just take it as and when or take any dosage because it's for a particular purpose to target a microorganism and so there's a right amount that needs to be taken for a particular duration and, and also you don't need to skip doses okay mm -hmm. like we normally do sometimes take it for about three days for an antibiotic that has been prescribed for a week and then we feel we are okay and then we leave it and maybe we take it today tomorrow we're supposed to be taken twice a day we take just one in a day yeah. and then tomorrow we continue okay that haphazard way of mm -hmm. using antibiotics mm -hmm. can also lead to antibiotic resistance and of course like i said from the beginning we are fond of taking medications that have been given to people mm -hmm. before and there's something we also need to take note of mm -hmm. we all have different genetic makeups even the same antibiotic that may be prescribed for you for that same condition if i have similar condition probably the antibiotic might not work i need a different one so uh these are the ways that I mean we can also we can go about to preserve antibiotics and also it also goes to the um, prescribers uh -huh. we should prescribe uh, in accordance with uh -huh. set guidelines okay I know there are instances where prescribers will normally um, give out certain medications or prescribe based on practices okay there are some things that probably they've learned over time in uh -huh. practice yes you, you you can do that but all should be in light of uh, the prescribed guidelines so okay. that we don't go off I mean the guidelines that we are supposed to use and um, also talking about the the regulators okay or the policy makers yes they are doing their work in fact they are doing their best we, 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 we should all come in come together and then help them uh, spurious medications or substandard medications on the market can also lead to, I mean, that because you, you, you tell me that probably it's 500 milligrams amoxicillin, but you will check and then it's not even up to that amount or half that amount, okay? Manufacturers and, I mean, all these people, we all need to come together and then help to prevent this uh, condition. So okay. by so doing, we can help to protect or preserve these antimicrobial uh, so okay. antibiotics. Yeah. Okay, but Thelma, don't you think we should make it impossible for people to get uh, antibiotics over the counter? Because if they will abuse it, then they might as well come with a prescription. Uh, yeah, um, that's, that's a good point. I personally wish it would be so. But like I said, it will take time for us to get, you, to get there because we live let me just use ghana as an example mm -hmm. because this is where i live and yeah. i've worked ghanaians are fond of um being self doctors self prescribers so they've experienced some illness before they went to the hospital and the doctor gave them amoxiclap so they want to come back to the pharmacy and take that same amoxiclap for all you know it may not be the same thing you were being treated for so it will take some time. That's why we are doing the awareness. It will take some time. And also I think the, the people or the public need to know that the, the different classes of drugs, that some drugs are prescription only. Okay. When we say prescription only, only the doctors are supposed to prescribe that. Okay. So with that knowledge, they will know that they don't have to just walk in for um, an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so that one alone, they need to know that, okay, okay 
there's only in a few some few cases that mm -hmm. pharmacists can um give that intervene okay. if they feel that okay this person they are suspecting a bacterial infection or something and they can intervene and give but ideally it's only it's okay. per prescription okay. strictly per prescription so people also need to know that because i'm sure a lot of people don't know that mm -hmm. so um, that's also why it comes so once they know this at least majority would respect okay. respect it so i think we should really put a stamp on that and secondly to add to what he said um in order to prevent these um abuse of mm -hmm. antibiotics we i think the people should also seek advice from their health professionals like instead of expecting antibiotics or wanting them to prescribe them antibiotics they should ask what are some some of the ways we can treat uh, ourselves without using without antibiotics because let me just use sore throat for example mm -hmm. people believe that when they have sore throat they have to take an antibiotic that they have to take an antibiotic it's never true well it's true to an extent the thing is there are two there are different types of sore throat oh. but majority of them are mostly viral okay. or viral origin or sometimes allergy allergic origin okay it's only like a handful that are biotic origin but bacterial sorry but they believe that because i have a sore throat i have to take antibiotics you see that school of thoughts must be abolished mm. okay so in that case like this with a sore throat you can do a symptomatic treatment you can even oranges yeah. i mean yeah. oranges can do the trick since yeah. they contain vitamin c guava is very rich in vitamin c um, aside that, you can gargle warm water, warm water with salt. Salt has antiseptic properties. Okay. okay. So, and I also think that, um, uh, yeah, because of these are some of the things. Yeah. With salt, you don't need antibiotics. Yeah. You can just go in for the normal, the honey, the lemon and stuff. Okay. If it progresses, like if you see that it's still not getting better, mm -hmm. then you can go and see your doctor and then he or she is in the best position to prescribe antibiotics but you don't come to the pharmacy and demand for the pharmacist to give you an antibiotic i have a problem with that <laughs> so I like they come and they demand and you feel okay that is not a thing for them what do you do about it i tell them that okay i i, I query them i ask them questions i don't just give them because they want to i need to know why you are taking it so that if something goes wrong because if something goes wrong it, at the end of the day, I give a drug, so they'll come back to me. So I have to make sure I'm doing my job well. I ask you, okay, so what's wrong? What's the problem? You tell me you have a sore throat. Per my expertise, I'll ask you, how is it like? Because I know that there are different types of sore throat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I ask you and you tell me, oh, there is um, pain, mm -hmm. at least I know that's a sign of uh, bacterial sore okay. Or it started a week ago or two weeks ago it's been long enough yeah. maybe there's a secondary infection there yeah. you see in that case i can intervene and give an antibiotic mm -hmm. per what you've told yeah. me because per my knowledge and expertise i know that when there is a sore throat and there's high temperature and there is um pain pain, pain on swallowing like you, you can hardly swallow even your own saliva mm -hmm. i know that it's most likely would be bacterial origin then mm -hmm. i can give but if there's nothing wrong, you're not feeling pain, it's just uncomfortable. I won't give it to you. I'll give you something else or a vitamin C or something. Okay. Yeah. I and they'll accept it. Some well, you way. would. If you don't, then... <laughs> to add up to what she's saying, um, me. with the question you asked, uh, making it impossible mm -hmm. for, for them to buy antibiotics. Yeah. You see, the issue is, I, I always believe in education, okay, and talking to people. If everybody is going to listen, there wouldn't even be any need to, I mean, create strict laws because mm -hmm. the person will know what he or she is about. Okay. And I'll say this to the public. Now, information is everywhere. People like to read. They like to pull out all sorts of things. We always say that when you come, just listen to what your healthcare professional is saying. You might have read an information. It's not bad, okay, to research things. But when you come, also listen to what the prescriber has to say. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by so doing, I'll charge all my, I mean, my fellow colleagues and also the health workers to also, I mean, be abreast with issues and also try to educate the client as much as possible. Because you realize that at a long, uh, in the long run, it goes a long way to help. Yeah. Uh, 
even if the person is not willing to listen to what you are saying, then you realize that you might have done your job. At a point, the person will think to some of these things and know that, yes, uh, I was educated or I was told. And so, I mean, we can, we can come together and do this wherever we find ourselves wherever we find ourselves, so let's be educating ourselves. Yeah. I charge the health professionals to also do their job. Let's educate them. As far as antimicrobial resistance is on it's the rise, or yeah. it keeps on going, okay. we shouldn't stop talking about it. Okay. And like she said from the beginning, I believe that it shouldn't be like a yearly thing. Mm -hmm. Like we come here, we talk about it, mm -hmm. and it's done. For me, I employ it day in and day out because mm -hmm. we have clients coming in every day to ask. It might be overwhelming, mm -hmm. but let's try as much as possible and educate them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And sorry to add to what he's saying. I think in this case, teamwork mm -hmm. on the part of the health professionals is also needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, because maybe, for example, a person walks into your pharmacy and they want an unnecessary reason, and you don't give it to them, and they go to another pharmacy, and they go to that pharmacy. If they also don't implement that, yeah. mm. they wouldn't be helping yeah. us. Yeah. We would we, then it's like there's no coordination yeah. in our work. We yeah. all have to come together and stand that no, we are not giving antibiotics unless it's prescription basis. Okay. Or if there's a pharmacist there, and the pharmacist can asse assess the person's symptoms and makes an intervention. Fine, that one is a different story. But if we should all come together yeah. and do that, these things will be minimal because. Even when the person comes and you don't give it to them and they are angry and they go to the next place and they Still do the same thing to them and they go to the next place and next time don't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. at the end of the day too, it also yeah, it heavily relies on us. We have to come together and decide that no, we are not doing this. If you want an antibiotic, go and see a general practitioner mm -hmm. so that they will assess you there and they will write it for you before. Okay. Otherwise, we are not serving at all. Okay. Okay. And that is another way to that we can kind of abolish the seal mm -hmm. of yes, antibiotics. Yes, because it's a bit too much. The, 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 the coordination aspect, mm -hmm. it also comes down to the prescribers and, and the pharmacists. Let me say the doctors and the pharmacists. Okay. okay. Mostly there's this feud. <laughs> it's like there's uh, an there issue is going on <laughs> between us. The uh -huh. doctor and the mm -hmm. pharmacist. So, so everybody feels that, I mean, I know. And oh. so there's no need, <laughs> I need to listen to you or whatever. So we need to come together and then help. Because yeah. if you, the prescriber, you write the medication, it's very difficult when you are trying to make an intervention yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. And so if we are all coming together to, to I mean, uh, communicate and see that this medication probably it comes to my end. Oh, I think probably, Doc, we could do it this way. And he also listens. I think we are all going to help, I mean, solve this <laughs> issue. Mm. So the coordination is um, all around. Yeah. Okay. All around. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then we are still in COVID. We had a lot of acetomycin and doxycycline being used to treat COVID. I want you to throw more light on it. Yeah. The use of acetomycin. <laughs> I knew this question was coming. Definitely. Yeah. You see, um, like I said, information is everywhere these days. Mm -hmm. When COVID came, a lot of people started researching. They started taking out stuff. They started searching for information. And um, here lies the case that President Trump also came in at a point to, I mean, speak in favor of azithromycin being used to treat COVID and there were, there were, I mean, successes. The next day, what we realized was there was a demand for azithromycin. Wow. Even mm -hmm. at a point in time, mm -hmm. you wouldn't even get azithromycin to buy. Hey, to treat, to yeah, treat, it was that serious. To treat a common condition. <laughs> wow. Just because someone of high repute has spoken about it, and there are some articles online by supposed, um, I mean, intellect, mm -hmm. okay, to, to tell us that yes, azithromycin can be used. All these, okay, lead to antibiotic water resistance. We already said that antibiotics are not for viral infections. COVID 19 is uh, uh, coronavirus, of course, the name even tells you that it's from okay. a viral source. Mm -hmm. And so, if you are using azithromycin in there, ask yourself, what is it going to do? There are people um, use that as an adjunct, okay, mm -hmm. to treat the condition together with hydroxychloroquine and the yeah. rest. But um, we, the health professionals, or probably the health professionals, know why they introduce that mm -hmm. um if we come out there and just throw the information out there the people come in and then they think that it will work for me yeah. I'm supposed to treat i mean my condition 
Here lies the case that people were even coming in to buy it to protect themselves, just to take it so that they don't um, get the condition. Okay, all these, I mean, led to or have led to antibiotic resistance at a point. And some people, I know that uh, as time goes on, they may even be taken as a traumatic and they will not work because of, <laughs> I mean, this condition yeah, that yeah. came. So the COVID is um, something that also, I mean, I mean, came up. The negative side is. Um, there was an increase in demand mm -hmm. yes. for this azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, mm -hmm. and which can also I mean, lead to antibiotic resistance. resistance. So we need to watch it. There is a reason why probably a prescriber might be giving you a particular mm -hmm. medication. Like mm -hmm. I said, always consult. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't just go out there because you have an information and you demand. And like she said, if they come and they demand and you don't give it to them, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Huh. We need to, I mean, look at this. All right. The pharmacist is wicked. He doesn't <laughs> want to give me what I want. Yeah. Okay, so we are wrapping up here. My mm -hmm. final question is, pharmaceutical industries are a business entity. They are aim to make profits. And then there comes antimicrobial resistance. So from a business perspective, I'm thinking, oh, if there's resistance, then it means there's a market. There's a need to supply something that can, you know, cure whatever is resisting this thing. But then the, these same pharmaceutical industries are telling us not to abuse it. Why is this happening? Is it that we have reached the end of the production of uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials? Or like, why is this happening? Because I'm seeing a business idea in it, but then you're telling us to desist from it. Yes, um, it's a very good question. Um, you know, pharmaceutical businesses are also there to, I mean, make money. Mm -hmm. But this there's something we all need to understand it's not the main purpose is not um just to make the money because okay. there are so many ways you can make money mm -hmm. the main thing is to help i mean the people get better and in return okay the money comes in so um even though you might see um a business aspect it is not easy developing molecules the antibiotics that we have if you abuse them it will get to a point in time that those which have already been produced will not work mm -hmm. and we need to go higher and even produce newer molecules molecules that we haven't seen before okay and developing molecules takes time it takes money it takes resources for even one medication to come out for it to be approved for consumption mm -hmm. and so if we are not careful and we don't preserve the ones we have it will get to a time that it will even be difficult to produce newer molecules and mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen we are all going to die mm -hmm. because the ones that are already there have been rendered useless mm -hmm. because of the abuse yeah. and what we need to um, know that uh, what we need to know is that the antibiotics that we have okay um, if they were not being abused probably it would have been easier to I mean use them to treat mm -hmm. varied mm -hmm. conditions mm -hmm. because we've are effective and so we need to go ahead and then I mean produce much more stronger one or newer newer I mean molecules yeah. that yeah. is why some of these pharmaceutical companies are always into innovation Okay, because you need to come up with newer molecules to help. It looks like the ones that are already in the system are not working. Yeah. Uh -huh. So even though you are seeing the business side, we are saying that let's protect or preserve the ones that we have. Because it's not easy to produce newer molecules. Let me use COVID-19 um, as an example. When COVID came, okay, we didn't have any medication at that time to treat. So we're being asked to wash our hands, wear our face masks and do all sort of stuff. Until... Some of these pharmaceutical companies, I mean, started researching, looking out for ways by which we can come up with a molecule. Look at the time that it took. Even though at that time the world was on a standstill, um, resources had to be developed, uh, uh, to be pulled quickly to make sure that these pharmaceutical companies come up with something. Even now that we have some antivirals that can take care of these conditions and even uh, supposed vaccines that can help. Look at the time frame and then the number of lives that we lost. Okay, so um, it's not easy just to come up with a medication. Okay, and look at the business side because even it will take some time. Yeah. Okay, not that even if you come up with a medication, as soon as you come up with a medication, you're going to make money. Yeah. It's going to take time. Mm -hmm. So let's preserve the ones we have. We can even help um, better advance the ones we have mm -hmm. than even thinking of new molecules because it's not easy in that yeah. sense. Okay, so that is what I would like to say. Okay. Do you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, okay. a, a little bit. He has pretty much said everything. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, it's more of a loss than a profit. 
if um, you are going to like be selling antibiotics. I say it's more of a loss than a profit because let's look at the bigger picture. Okay, we are looking at the future. We are not looking at the now. Mm -hmm. Maybe the now you make a profit, but in the future, they're going to run at a loss because like he said, there'll come a time when these antibiotics, a, a whole lot of time, because now that you are going to run series of tests, look for the organisms and the re like the resources needed to produce that new um, drug. Mm -hmm. You get my point. And so whilst that is happening, you can't even sell the current ones that you have because they are not working anymore. And majority of your money is going into getting resources mm -hmm. for the new ones. So you've actually run at a loss. Okay. And I mean. Even whilst they are running the trials, like testing the drug to see how best it's going to perform, it, it, it takes a whole lot of time. We are waiting for approval and stuff. And even when it comes on the market, it needs to be marketed. Yeah. Like the health professionals, the doctors, yeah. the, um, the nurses, the pharmacists, the, the policy makers, they all need to be aware of this drug and how best it can they need to be educated on what the drug is coming to do, how best they can perform. Okay. Now we talk about supplies and all that, yes. you see. Look at like he said, we mentioned the COVID. It took a whole year. But by that time a whole lot of people yeah, died. A, lot a whole lives, lot yeah. of money, resources yeah. were pumped into you know, we uh, into these new resources. Mm -hmm. So it's actually more of a loss than yeah. Okay, so your final words of advice to the general public and then ways in which if we are not going to use antibiotics, how can we, you know, take care of ourselves and boost our immune systems and stuff like that? Your final words. Okay, so um, we, we come back to the basics. Okay, so like, like, like as we all know, we wash our hands. Um, frequently, even this washing of hands thing, we should have been doing this before no, COVID. No. <laughs> you know, we had to take COVID to wake COVID us up. COVID was our wake up call, unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yes, we should keep up with um, the washing of hands regularly and the use of hand sanitizers. Okay, because as we are there, even though we are healthy, we have a lot of microbes on our skins that we can't even see. see. Okay, if we, I wish we could see them, mm -hmm. then we'd yeah, see that a hey, we yeah. really need to like keep ourselves neat. If we could see them, a lot of people would wake up. Okay, <laughs> an education on how to wash your hands the right way. Some people don't even wash their hands, so they just open their and rest their hands and mm -hmm. just do something. You haven't done anything, mm -hmm. you've rather like woken up the, the microbes. Okay, so you use anti microbial antibacterial, we should look out for those. Wash your hands under running water. Okay use your antibiotics and your personal self maintain personal height keep your surroundings neat keep your your body neat and also internally you have to be taking in your multivitamins that because that will help boost your immune system be looking out for vitamin c be looking out for zinc zinc is also very good okay. in boosting the immune system and probiotics mm -hmm. these contain like good bacteria you know, we have good bacteria and bad bacteria. Initially, I mentioned pathogenic bacteria. Those are the ones that cause the illnesses. But we also have good bacteria. And sometimes these infections come because there is an imbalance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. So we can also be taking in probiotics. Okay, okay. instead of taking antibiotics, we can take probiotics. And examples of probiotic containing um, substances we have yogurt the fresh yogurt we can be oh, taking okay. that from time to time and um some of the we drugs have enterogemina, we have enterogemina it's yes. in the pharmacy mm -hmm. we, we can also be taking uh, that yeah. exactly so probiotics we should eat well okay they are really basic it's nothing mm -hmm. over the top yes. so these are some of the things mm -hmm. that we can do for us okay. Yeah. Yes. Also, to add up to what she says, in any case, if you think you need an antibiotic, when you consult your healthcare professional, um, don't skip doses if you've been prescribed um, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Don't use antibiotics that have been prescribed for someone else, like we said. Um, don't um, make sure the antibiotics that you are taking, you've taken it for the, the duration that has been prescribed for. If you are taking it for seven days, make sure you take it for seven days. 
at any case, if you feel you need it again, still go back to your care professional because probably you might not need that same antibiotic. I mean, similar conditions. They walk into the pharmacy with the same thing. Antibiotics cannot be treated that way. Also, those who purposefully keep some of the antibiotics for use at a later time, mm. they should also check that. You don't do that. They should resist. Yes. They should. And also, if at any point in time you need to dispose of some medications, make sure you do it well. Okay. okay. Medications, are, I mean, they are very risky. Mm -hmm. You don't just throw them anywhere. So mm -hmm. make sure you dispose them well. So, I mean, these are the, some of the things that I'll talk about. And let all of us come together and help fight this. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Ebenezer says, let's, let's all come together and fight this. And then Thelma says, please desist from, you know, walking into the pharmacy just <laughs> to demand, please, please, also the fees that come. Yeah. Please stop that. This has been Health Africa on AAU TV. I've had Ebenezer, Jari Bidiako, and Selassie Thelma Amadumako, both pharmacists, discussing or celebrating World uh, Anti Antimicrobial Awareness Week 2020. Do your part. Let's all do our part. And let's desist from such practices. My name is Bridget Amadenza. Do stay tuned for other programs. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, KinoFlow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280.
Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280.